followers Ustada Layla Nashiba as she details the story of Um Ruman, the mother of Aisha and wife of Asadi. Alhamdulillah, wassalat, wassalam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to our series, The Heroines of Islam. This is our series, The Heroines of Islam. And this has become one of the most provocative series that I have ever taught because a lot of the people uh, tell me that they've never heard or had another daya teach it to them the way I do, because the way I teach about these female companions, I try to emphasize, you know, the struggles they went through in their personal lives and try to compare their struggles to the ones that we face today as Muslims as a way of showing you sisters how to overcome your problems in your marriage, how to um, uh, uh, overcome the problems you have with your relatives, not accepting the fact that you are a convert, you know? So, you know, I, I, and also I try to uh, take their struggles and use them as a means of giving you hope to carry on with your purpose in life. And alhamdulillah, it seems that so many of you are learning from this series. I can see it in your responses in the other classes and also in your personal lives. Remember the companions of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were the best of this nation. They were the best of this nation. They were the best of this nation and they were all converts. Hello. So I don't know why people would ask that stupid question, but um, uh, they should be our role models, your hero, your role model. First of all, understand that the life coach of the Muslim is the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His companions are our role models. And you have so many thousands literally thousands, literally thousands that we can pick from and choose from as role models for us. So today what I'm gonna do is the story that I promised to do of Um Rum, excuse me, Um Ruman. Um Ruman. She was the mother of Aisha, ready Allahu Anha. And she was also the wife of Abu Bakr. So I'm gonna do her story today. And she was one of the early converts, one of the first to convert to Islam. And I'm gonna also uh, 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 give you a insight into how to handle disagreements. Remember in Dr. Assam's class on Saturdays, we're focusing in on how Islam teaches us to deal with differences. Well, when you learn the story of Um Ruman, you get to see how the female companions dealt with disagreements, how they dealt with slander, how they dealt with gossip, how they dealt with jealousy, how they dealt with hate. And the thing that I tell you guys all the time, Allah created us and put us on this earth to be tested in our belief in him. And he's gonna test us with the things we care about the most, our husbands, our children, our lives even. Well, you get to see how Um Ruman handled the one of the greatest trials of her life. And that is having her baby, her baby girl, viciously slandered, viciously attacked, you know, uh, 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 based on lies. So with that said, uh, let's put the PowerPoint up and uh, let's see if I can do this right. Uh, hold on, I'm gonna take this down for the people in Zoom. I'm gonna, oh, let me take this. Uh, Nina, you guys, uh, you, you guys screenshot these two? You guys are screen- Yeah, I screenshot them definitely. Okay. 
So for those of you watching on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Trovo, Twitch, and all the other platforms and Twitter, uh, take screenshots too. I'm going to take these things down so y'all can see. You can screenshot the page. Take screenshots of the PowerPoints. So that way, again, you can print them out. At the end of the class, print them out like a little booklet and review, and you will have the stories for yourselves to look at and review when you're going through a hardship in life. So I took it down. Yeah. So it's just like, yeah. Okay. Let me, um, I'm going to share you guys to um, Instagram. Okay. That's Instagram for the people on uh, Zoom. For myself and everyone else here, you should see me pop up in a minute. Oh, well, I forgot. I got to put the PowerPoint back up. Hold on. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Screen share Om Ruman. And I'm going to make it big screen for you. Okay. And. All right. I don't know if I did or not, but if it doesn't matter. Okay, so this is the story of Um Ruman. Um Ruman. This is the first page. Make sure y'all take a screenshot of that. Okay. Um Ruman was the wife of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. She was also the mother of Aisha, ready Allahu anha. Last week I did the story of Asma. Asma was Aisha's sister, but uh, they did not share the same mother, just the same father. Remember, Asma's mother was Kutela. Kutela refused to convert to Islam. Okay, remember when Abu Bakr, ready Allahu on her, when he arrived back into Mecca from a business trip and was told that his friend, the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had declared himself a prophet and a messenger. Abu Bakr was the first to run to him, the first to run to him and give his allegiance to him and, uh, and, and convert to Islam. And then after Abu Bakr converted to Islam, he went to his wives and he told them to convert to the new way of life. All of his wives refused to convert to Islam except for Um Ruman. And she was the mother of Aisha and Abdul Rahman. So what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did was divorced all his other wives. And, and this is a big point to ponder because so many of you young brothers come to me and you're always asking me, Sister Layla, can a man marry a Christian woman? Yes, you can marry a Christian woman, but it comes with conditions. And the thing is, why are you brothers so eager to marry Kafir women when there's a lot of single Muslim women around? You brothers are quick and eager to marry Kafirs, whereas the companions weren't like that. They divorced their wives who didn't convert. Okay? So Um Ruman, she was the only wife that, uh, that uh, converted to Islam with her husband and the rest he divorced. So thus she became the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's mother-in-law. And also Abdul Rahman ibn Abu Bakr Sadiq, you know, that was her son. And that was Aisha's uh, a full-blooded brother. Abdul Rahman was her full-blooded bro brother, okay? And uh, being that the Arabs were people of the camel, people of the tents, people of the Arabian horses, Remember, I tell you, the Arabic women were not sitting at home licking pus and prostrating to no man. They were a warrior race of people, the male and females, just like the Vikings. The Vikings, male and female, were warriors. The Romans, the Greeks were warriors. Cause these were the dark ages. This was the medieval period of history. 
So the Arabic women, they were trained in warfare too. Because if you weren't trained in warfare, you wouldn't survive. Because women had no rights before Islam. Women were simply chattel. Women were the spoils of war. And so were the children. So like most Arabic women of her time, Um Ruman was trained not only to fight, but she was also good with horses and good with camels. Her son, Abdul Rahman, was an excellent horseman. And her son, Abdul Rahman, grew up to be a, a master strategist in war, the art of warfare. Okay? He learned a lot from the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He learned a lot from his father and from the Quraysh. But it was his mother who taught him courage. It was his mother who taught him valor. And Um Ruman, her real name was Zainab, but she was known as, by her kunya as Um Ruman. As you guys see, Zainab and Bara, those were two popular Arabic names back in these days. Okay? Um Ruman was a patient and tolerant woman. She was known for not making hasty decisions. That's where Aisha, her daughter, inherited that. Aisha, ready Allahu anha, remember she couldn't read or write because the Arab, very few of the Arabs knew how to read and write. In fact, of all the wives of the prophet, the only one that could read and write was Hafsa. None of the other wives knew how to read or write, but they had good memories. The Arabs were known for those photographic memories. Aisha, ready Allahu anha, could not read or write, but she had a photographic memory that she inherited from her mother. And also she inherited the ability to decipher things or understand things, to not make hasty judgments. She inherited that from both her mother and her father. And when you look at the history of Um Ruman, her mother, you can see the way she handled herself in times of trial. For example, when the people accused her daughter, Aisha, ready Allah on her, of uh, adultery, she handled that with dignity as a mother. She handled that with class. She handled that with humility as a mother, you know, she didn't allow uh, the people to get to her. She knew that they were jealous of her daughter. Okay. Also, when her husband Abu Bakr first converted to Islam, she didn't hesitate to accept Islam because her mind, she had that type of mind, she could rationalize. She understood that there was no uh, entity worthy of worship but Allah. All the Arabs believed in Allah, but they did not believe that Allah was the only one worthy of worship. But she understood that. So that's why of all the other wives, she didn't linger in giving up her the religion of her forefathers because it made sense to her. She never worshiped idols anyway. Okay, Um Ruman was never an idol worshiper just like Abu Bakr wasn't either, because in her mind, she couldn't rationalize talking to a statue that couldn't answer you back. So she was one of the early converts uh, to Islam. And she was raised in the area of Arabia known as Sarat. Abu Bakr was not her first husband. Remember, before Islam, the women, you know, were married very young. Most children were married at birth. If a, a boy and a girl were born back in those days, they were promised in marriage to somebody else's daughter or somebody else's son. So like most uh, people back then, she was promised in marriage to a young man from her tribe named Abdullah Ibn Harith Ibn Sakbara Azdi. 
So when she reached the age of puberty, which was the custom back then, when a girl started her menses and the boy was mature, they would marry. So that was her first husband. And she had a son by him. You guys have heard of the companion named Tufail Ibn Abdullah. That was her son. Okay. Tufail was her son, not from Abu Bakr, but from Abdullah Ibn Harith. Her first husband, after she gave birth to her son, they moved to Mecca and her husband became the partner and friend of Abu Bakr. But right after moving to Mecca, her husband died. And, Lee, and when he died, he, his wife and son were left with no one to take care of them. Abu Bakr, he loved his friend who had died and he took pity on the state of his wife and his son. So that's when Abu Bakr married her. And that was also a common thing back in the dark ages, in the medieval period. If a woman's husband died, she became the property of his brother, okay? But in this case, when her husband died, Abu Bakr being his best friend offered to marry her and her family agreed to that. And so did her husband, her first husband's family agreed to that too. So she, Abu Bakr married her and they were very happy with this. And she gave birth, that's when she got pregnant and gave birth to her second son, Abdul Rahman. And then after she gave birth to him, that's when she gave birth to her daughter, Aisha. Everybody understand that? And of course, Abu Bakr had other wives. He had Kutayla, who was uh, Asma's mother, and he had uh, 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 Abdullah and Asma by her. And they say he had four, four other wives too. Before Islam, there was no limit on how many wives a man could have. They had many large harems. Well, Abu Bakr, they say, had four other wives, including her, but he divorced all of them when they refused to slam, except for her, okay? So Umru man, ready Allahu anha, accepted Islam and she swore allegiance to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam right there in mecca and then when the muslims migrated and left mecca for medina she was amongst that group so that means she witnessed all the atrocities that the quraysh committed against the muslims also she was a good friend of Khadija, ready Allahu on her. Her and Khadija were close friends. So she would also uh, support her husband, Abu Bakr, and, and trying to spread the dawah and help the prophet. And she also helped Khadija. Her and Khadija were very good friends. She drew inspiration from her husband, Abu Bakr, and she found peace and comfort with him. And she was the type of woman that Khadijah was to support him, to let him know his worth. She was known for her patience. They say she was very, very patient. She very rarely complained about anything. She loved the law. And they say she would spend hours in Mecca, hours just praying, you know, praying for a law, you know, to send comfort to the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and uh, praying to a law to send comfort to the Muslims. When she saw her husband's efforts to spread Islam, uh, taking effect, she uh, she would support him through by with her admiration and moral support, and the rest of her time was spent teaching her children 
the traditions of Islam. That's how her son, Abdul Rahman, he didn't just learn how to be a perfect horseman from her because she was good with horses. But he also learned his courage from her too. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to visit their house and he would always greet Um Ruman and he was to, would tell her how proud he was of her and to keep encouraging and instilling the love of goodness in all her children, especially Aisha. Because remember, after Khadijah Radi Allahu Anha passed away, that's when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, had a dream that Aisha was delivered to him by the angel Jibreel. So the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew that Aisha was to be his wife. So he shared this dream with Umm Ruman and her husband Abu Bakr and they were happy about this. So Aisha was promised, which was the culture back then. That's how they did. And not just the Arabic culture, but the European culture, the Viking culture, the Roman culture, their children were promised in marriage at birth. So Aisha was promised to him. He married her at the age of six. That was the custom back then. Aisha ready Allahu on her, the, the marriage contract was agreed to when she was six years old but the marriage was not consummated until she was the age of puberty, which was nine. So just to let you guys know, after I, Khadijah had died, after the prophet had that dream about Aisha, he presented it to her mother and her father, and they knew that it meant he would marry her, and her father immediately agreed to the contract. So she was married to him at six but did not serve as a wife until puberty. Okay. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated to Medina because the Muslims were not able to practice Islam in Mecca, of course he migrated with Abu Bakr, Umm Ruman's husband. And later, after they arrived there, uh, Um Ruman didn't join them until later, but she held down the fort because after the Quraysh found out that Abu Bakr and the prophet had left Mecca, you know, she had to sit there and put up a, a act. She had to pretend that her husband left her money and she had to pretend that everything was fine and nothing had changed, that her husband was just on a, a business venture, but he'd be back. So she held down the fort. Then finally, the word came, the prophet sent P, uh, a Zaid and a couple of others back to get her and his family. And so then she joined uh, the, her husband, Abu Bakr, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina. And when she arrived in Medina, her husband, Abu Bakr, had a house. Now, Abu Bakr was a rich man. The Abu Bakr had a house in the suburbs of Medina, near Cuba. And he also had an apartment built and attached to the mosque too. So she had a home waiting for her when she arrived in Medina. And it was when they arrived in Medina that Aisha ready Allahu on her had become puberty. Aisha had got her menses during a trip to Medina, but Um Ruman hid that, that knowledge from Abu Bakr because Aisha was her baby. That was her baby and Aisha was spoiled. And Umm Ruman spoiled her and she wanted to hold on to her a little bit longer. But then finally, after a little while, Umm Ruman let it be known that Aisha was now a woman. And that's when Umm Ruman uh, gathered her daughter and told, asked her, are you ready? to take on your responsibilities as a wife 
Aisha agreed. And that's when Umru man took her, washed her up, combed her hair, dressed her and um, all of that. And Aisha moved into the home to fulfill her obligations as a wife. And she was nine years old, but she was a woman. She was a puberty woman. So once Aisha, ready Allahu Anha, married the prophet, we talked about how Aisha had a problem with her tongue. She was a young girl, a kid at heart, very spoiled, very flippant. Um Ruman was always at her house teaching her how to be a wife. And also she would reprimand Aisha about her tongue too. She was constantly reminding Aisha to not be so arrogant, to not be so spoiled. And when the hypocrites wrongfully accused Aisha, ready Allahu Anha, of adultery, that's when her mother, Um Ruman, proved her patience and proved her faith in Allah. Because Um Ruman, it was hard for her to keep this knowledge away from Aisha. She knew that her daughter was not guilty of such a horrendous sin, but she also knew that her daughter wouldn't be able to handle that type of, of slander. So Um Ruman kept her tongue silent until Aisha learned of the gossip herself. And when Aisha ready Allah who on her learned of the gossip herself, she asked the prophet if she could go stay with her parents. And the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allowed her. And when Aisha uh, moved into the home with her mother and father, Um Ruman was there to comfort her. And that's how you could tell what a great mother she was because she was the one that kept telling Aisha, don't worry, people are gonna always slander you. People are gonna always be jealous of you. They're gonna be jealous of you because of who you are. Look who your father is. Look who you're married to. Plus you're beautiful, plus you're smart, plus you're gifted. So Umru Man had her hands filled uh, trying to keep her daughter calm and keep her daughter from completely just losing it. Okay. We have the Hadith, whereas after Aisha had moved in with her parents with the prophet's permission, the prophet came to see her and she was sitting with her mother, Um Ruman, crying. And the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, felt bad for her because he loved her and she was his wife, but he also had to be neutral because he was a messenger of Allah. So he went to her and he said, oh, Aisha, if you committed this sin, then ask Allah to forgive you because Allah forgives all sins, no matter how big they are. He said, but if you didn't commit this sin, then don't grieve because Allah will absolve you. Allah will prove your innocence. Aisha was so upset. She couldn't even answer him. So she looked at her mother, Um Ruman, and she said, mother, speak on my behalf, champion me. And this is important. Back in those days, in the medieval period, you watch your old movies like Robin Hood and Lancelot and all that. Those are fairy tales, but there's always truth to some of those tales. Men would accuse, if ever a, a man accused a woman's honor, attacked her honor, a queen's honor, honor or a woman who is uh, the wife of a man who's a ruler's honor, the, uh, the, 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 the ruler would ask for someone to champion her, just like King Arthur. King Arthur could not champion Genevieve when she was accused of adultery. So he asked Lancelot, not knowing that Lancelot was the one that fouled her, he asked he heard him the champion because the king or the ruler cannot serve two masters. So this is what made Aisha so upset. Nobody championed her. 
The prophet had went to the mosque and asked, is there anyone who will champion my wife to testify that what they say about her is not true? Nobody would, not her father. And so now he had come to her home and she looked at her mother. She said, mother, speak to him. In other words, champion me. But her mother didn't either. So imagine the pain Aisha radiallahu anha went to. And it wasn't because Um Ruman and Abu Bakr believed Aisha was guilty. The reason that they didn't champion her is because they, they knew that Allah would. It was not their job to do that. It was not their job to do that. Okay? So... When Aisha realized that not even her mother, who she knew loved her more than anyone, when she realized that not even her mother <clears throat> would champion her, that's when Aisha, ready Allahu anha, said that, why should I tell you anything? She said, if I told you that I was, was guilty, I would be lying. But if I told you that I was not guilty, you won't believe me. She said, so why should I say anything? <clears throat> she said, and no one else will champion me. She said, so I'm going to do like Yusuf, like the father of Yusuf did. She said, I will be patient and seek the help of Allah since no one else, not my parents or anyone else, will champion me. That shows how strong Aisha was. Okay. Right after Aisha ready Allah who on her made that statement, that's when Allah sent down the verses of the Quran, you know, championing Aisha, saying that she was not guilty of the, the, the allegations made against her. And, and that's when Um Ruman was so proud. In fact, Um Ruman uh, asked Aisha, she said, oh, Aisha, thank your husband. Thank your husband, the prophet, for vindicating you. But Aisha said, no, I have no reason to thank him. He didn't vindicate me. She said, I thank Allah because Allah is the one that vindicated me. And this made Um Ruman proud because she knew then that she did her job as a mother, raising her daughter to believe in a law first and foremost, to put a law first and foremost over even her husband. Okay. So Um Ruman, may Allah be pleased with her. She was a woman known for the time she spent in prayer. She struggled in the way of Allah with the original companions in Mecca. She also participated, you know, with the battles uh, in, in, uh, in Medina. She would bring water to the wounded and she was like her daughter, a nurse. She would care for the wounded. She was a dutiful wife who stood by her husband's side at all times. One day, Abu Bakr came home and found her praying but he could see that her body was not positioned right. So that's when Abu Bakr told her, you should be calm. Make sure that when you bow, that you wait a few seconds to let your body calm. He said, this will help with your concentration. And after that, Um Ruman was known for the calmness that she adapted in her prayers. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam respected her a whole lot. In fact, he considered her a woman, a woman to learn from in regards to how to be a good wife. And let me tell you why. Because Um Ruman knew how to balance. She wasn't one of those parents that was so in love of her children that she thought that her children did no harm. She recognized when her children transgressed the limits and she would be quick to reprimand them. For example, one day, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was praising Khadijah because remember, Um Ruman was a good friend of Khadijah too. 
He was talking about, you know, how he missed Khadija and was speaking about her good virtues to Umm Ruman. Aisha was there and she got jealous. And she told the prophet, why are you sitting here talking about a woman that's dead as if she was the only woman on earth? The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was shocked. And Umm Roman, she reprimanded Aisha for saying that. And then she apologized to the prophet saying, don't, you know, she's young. I'm going to train her. I'm going to teach her. You know, let me, let me discipline her. You know, she wanted to discipline Aisha for what she said. But the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told her, no, don't discipline her physically. You know, just, um, you know, talk to her. All right. We've talked about that when I did the story of Aisha, ready Allahu anha. So Umm Ruman, like I said, the prophet respected her because she knew when to hold and knew when to fold. She was not one of the mothers that would defend their children when her, their children were wrong. She was quick to reprimand Aisha for her smart mouth and her disrespect whenever Aisha uh, exhibited it. Okay. Um Ruman. There's a weak hadith, and I want to put this here because I want y'all to be aware of this hadith from the um, Sufis. That's not correct. There's a weak hadith that says Um Ruman passed away in the sixth year after migration. And there, it, that hadith says that after he buried her, the prophet asked Allah to forgive her of her sins. And the prophet said, if you want to see a virgin, Hureen of paradise, look at Um Ruman. This hadith is not authentic. I repeat, that hadith is not authentic because the El Hureen are not from this world. They are different. They are women that are not of this world. Any woman that dies in this world will be raised up as a woman from this world. We will not enter into paradise and become El Hureens. So that hadith is not authentic. That's why I put it there. Okay. The most reliable hadith says that Um Ruman died not too long after the accusations against Aisha were proven untrue. They say that she took what happened to Aisha affected her so badly that she got sick. She caught a fever and she ended up dying not long after that. And the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led her funeral prayer. And when he entered her grave, he raised his hands and asked Allah to forgive her. And he said, oh, Allah, you know what Um Ruman suffered for your sake and for your messenger's sake. Forgive her of her sins. This hadith is authentic. There's also uh, another hadith that's not as authentic as this that says she died during long after the prophet but that one is not authentic either this one here is most authentic that she died right after the slander against aisha when i when allah proved aisha's innocence aisha took care of her mother while her mother was sick and her and she died and the prophet led her funeral prayer and said if you want to see a woman that will be of paradise, it would be Um Ruman, but he did not refer to her as an El Hurin. Remember, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, those who believe in him and do good deeds and humble themselves before their Lord, they will be the people of paradise to dwell therein forever. Well, Um Ruman was a woman who believed in Allah who did a lot of good deeds for the sake of Allah. And she was known for humbling herself in prayer before her Lord. So inshallah, she will be a dweller of paradise. And that's the story of Um Ruman. Everybody understand? 
that's her story. There's nothing else. But uh, again, I wanted to put that, uh, let you guys know that Hadith about El, her being an El Hurin, that is not, I repeat, that is not authentic. No woman from this world will enter paradise as an El Hurin. The El Hurin are not of a higher status than us. The women of this world are of a higher status than the El Hurin. Why? Because as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the El Hurin were created to worship Allah without free will. The women of this world, we chose to worship Allah with free will. And that's why Allah says the women of this world will live in palaces and they will sit upon thrones served by immortal boys. Whereas the El Hurin will be the reward for the men of this world and they will live in tents. So again, if y'all hear that hadith, that is not authentic. No woman is gonna die and, and be a Hurin. You wouldn't wanna be because they're of a lower status than us, just as the angels are of a lower status than us. All right. Okay. So, Supana Kala Huma wa Biham Dika, a shadow on Laila Haila, and to a stock the Ruko wa Tubu Lake. Are there any questions or comments?